Amen. Come on and let's praise God in this place for 105 young persons coming together in a virtual format to remind us that we should lift every voice and sing. We celebrate our historically black colleges and universities on this Sunday. Uh, we celebrate the lives and the aspirations of those young persons. And we join in harmony with parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, adopted parents and adopted relatives uh, who make it possible for young persons to attend institutions of higher learning. And it is our prayer that on this day that you will be very kind and generous as we attempt to make an impact in the lives of persons yet unknown to us. Amen. And so let us pray now to invoke God's presence in this worship experience. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, we come now on this Sunday, a Sunday where we shall not forget the contributions of our ancestors. A Sunday that we shall not forget the impact of that teacher who believed in us when we did not believe in ourselves. God, but we realize that oftentimes we forget about uh, that person who was our Sunday school teacher. That person who took us to YPD meetings, youth retreats, those persons who led summer programs to keep us off the streets, those persons who demonstrated love and kindness to us. So God, we come now thanking you for every educator who's had an impact on our lives. We thank you, oh God, for those persons who were not our formal educators, but through their example, we, we were committed to do our best. And so God, we say thank you. God, we thank you now for uh, those relatives who, who pack trunks for us to take to our first dorm room. Those persons who, who bought linen for our small beds. Those persons in the church who, who sent care packages. God, we, we say thank you. We thank you for every church member who, who put a piece of money in our hands when we came home from school. We say thank you. God, we could not have made it, first of all, without you. Now, God, we come acknowledging that We've been less than perfect. But Lord, forgive us of our sins, oh God. Help us to find our first love. African Methodism first was a place where educational needs were met. So God, we thank you for the AME Church. We thank you for every school that she's birthed. We, we thank 
thank you for Allen University. We thank you for Morris Brown College. We thank you for Evan Waters College. We thank you for Stillman College. We say thank you right now, God. We thank you for those persons who who, who sold fish dinners and, and chicken dinners so that our doors would stay open. We say thank you, God. For God, we realize that all of our help comes from you. It, it, it doesn't come from, from the White House. It, it doesn't come from the halls of Congress, but, but it comes from you. All of our help comes from you. Now, God, allow your spirit to overflow in this sanctuary. Touch everyone who is in attendance today, God. Touch them. Touch every family. Touch every child right now God in the name of Jesus we declare in decree that we shall never forget from whence our help comes have your way oh God in the name of Jesus we pray amen and amen
Amen. Aren't you glad that your help comes from the Lord? How, how many of you are glad that your help comes from the Lord? Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of John, the 21st chapter, verses 15 and 16. And we will be reading from the New International Version uh, translation, the NIV, John 21, 15 through 16. And within, when they had finished eating, and Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Amen. Why, in, why is education important to, t to talking, taking care of my sheep? Knowledge used under the guidance of God promotes understanding, compassion, empathy, and inclusion. It is not enough that studies show that 85% of HBCU graduates had higher mobility success than the average graduate across all institutions in the U.S. It is not enough to report that HBCUs enroll 0.1% of the student population, but account for 20% of black students completing a bachelor's degree. Right. It is not enough that HBCUs, also known as the engineers of upward mobility, enroll more low-income students than other colleges with nearly 70% of HBCUs students attaining at least middle-class middle status. Missions of our 107 HBCUs are intentional in graduating engaged and involved humans that address societal ills and challenges. Academically, scientifically, and humanly, the graduates of HBCUs are expected to function in societies in a communal sense of being their brother's keeper to embrace the more inclusive culture of care and not the Western model of individualism. with one 
shelter in the time of storm. HBCUs do not reject individuals based on their race, creed, religion, sexual preference, etc., and never had a history of doing so. Jesus' sheep are all of mankind. HBCUs have always been a safe haven for those of the black diaspora, and the safety net is ever more expanding. In the current racially charged climate, that witnessed increased attacks against Asians and Latinos, HBCUs are seeing a significant rise in enrollment for those who want to learn, but do it in a safe environment. Take care of my sheep. Be change agents to form a more perfect nation and world. HBCUs are known for producing change agents who believe that all should have those inalienable rights as promised in the US Constitution. Domestic tranquility cannot be achieved without institutions that do not promote fair and moral treatment. In the fight for the equality, equity, and dignity of the Lord's sheep, Martin Luther King, a Morehouse College graduate, challenged these institutions with a vision that catapulted the civil rights movement. Third Good Marshall, a graduate from Lincoln University, and Howard University Law School was the legal architect for the movement, challenging unjust practices throughout the nation. Students from HBCUs in southern states led the charge, 
demanding humane and fair treatments for blacks in public establishments. North Carolina A&T University and Bennett College students confronted segregation in Greensboro, North Carolina at lunch counters, demanding to be served with dignity and respect. Fisk University students led by Miriam Berry, John Lewis, Diane Nash, founded the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee confronted segregation in Nashville, Tennessee.
became a producer um, for this HBCU Sunday. I reached out to our current students and alumni, and we actually did a video with Zoom. So without further ado, I want to present to you some of our alum and our current students who are in HBCUs. All right, um, so my name is Shawnee Thomas. I currently attend Morgan State University. And I would say I chose an HBCU first because it let me connect back to my culture and who I'm used to being around. So it's kind of, it's still a new experience because you're gonna be able to be around people you've never met. I have friends who are from Chicago, who are from Florida, who are from Maryland, just like me. So I have friends that are in many different states and they bring those ideals and their culture back from their states, but it's still people who look like me and kind of have the same fight and the same drive that I do. And that's why I chose an HBCU. Hi, my name is Farshan Dwight um, and I actually had the opportunity to attend two HBCUs. Um, the first one for my undergrad degree was the Allen University in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, and the second was, of course, Go Bears, uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore. Um, the reason why I chose to attend the HBCU is because of the supportive environment um, to be able to connect the wonderful opportunity for networking um, and just to feel ultimately the support. Um, I will say that I had the opportunity to uh, connect with people from South Carolina all the way back home um, to the um, BNB metropolitan area. Hi, um, my name is Brianna Ford. I attended North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I chose an HBCU because it's just like everybody else said, being around people that look like me was very important and especially strong leaders in the community. There were so many in this area and to go down there and to experience their culture, bring my culture there. Um, lots, of, lots of lifelong friends and mentors in that environment as well. Strong black women um, in the community. Just It's just a lot of people to look up to and it was a great environment. My name is Taylor Hawkins and I am a University of Maryland Eastern Shore alum. Um, the reason why I chose an HBCU, um, I always wanted to go to HBCU. I personally wanted to continue the tradition in my family. Um, I could go back from my great great grandmother who attended Spelman in the early 1900s. And my grandparents went and my parents went to an HBCU. And so I wanted to continue that tradition by just going to HBCU. And frankly, I didn't know I had a choice. So I went to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore because they had a golf program. And I thought it was pretty interesting um, growing up in golf. I thought it would be great to attend HBCU with the first golf program, you know, in in the HBCU world. And so it was a tremendous experience for me. And looking back, the friends that I have from college and the professors, I always remember when somebody told me you need to go to a HBCU because they're not going to remember you as a number, they're gonna remember you as a name. And so that's all facts because I could still talk to professors, I could still talk to mentors that I've, I've developed relationships from college. I still talk to my friends. There's nothing like a HBCU homecoming. So I love my HBCU and that's my reason why I went. This is Margaret. Curly Smith Perkins. I attended two HBCUs, Virginia State University, Petersburg, Virginia, and Bowie State University, Bowie, Maryland. And at the time when I went to college, there were not a whole lot of choices um, for Negroes, 
African Americans to attend schools. Uh, and I chose Virginia State because it's a state run school. Um, there are bonds and things that we are gathered from going to that college, friends for, for a lifetime, mentors for a lifetime. Um, lots of my professors um, remember as the as we have said, lots of your professors continue to know you. Thank you for having me to make this statement. Um, share a moment in your life where you really felt the pride of going to an HBCU. And I'm going to share with you Hurricane Katrina. You remember that. And um, I remember Howard University students making a decision to um, accept the Xavier and Dillard students and they made room in their, their dormitories, even though their dormitories were sleeping too, they added an extra bed so that those students could come to Howard and continue their studies. I remember the professors taking the students out and buying them clothes and so forth because some of their, their clothes and their articles were destroyed. Um, we reached out to professors and they took them shopping. I remember War Memorial AME Church buying share for these students during that time. So, it, you know, just to be part of two institutions, and that would be the AME Church and the HBCUs who are just caring and they're just community oriented to make sure that we continue to progress our people. So let's start with whoever wants to chime in about what gave you that great pride? What moment really instilled that pride that you were part of an HBCU? I, I can go first. So one moment was um, after the murder of George Floyd and a lot of the protests began, uh, Morgan State was one of the first schools to have their own protest in Baltimore. And that day was like no other because in the middle of COVID, Pretty much every campus organization, every student, it was endless people. They Everybody came together. We were all in different cities, different states because of COVID. They sent everybody home. Everybody still found a way to come back to Baltimore and walk through the streets and protest. There were fundraisers and money raised. There was donations to the homeless. And there was, there was just so much activism just from that terrible moment that sparked because of that. So that was one time I was, I took so much pride in our school because they found a way to give back and to show their activism and to speak up for our community. Thank you. Anyone else? So um, I would like to talk about something. It was also recent during um, election season, Morgan was actually one of the few well, the only university in Maryland and one of few universities to become a polling station where and they actually made it so that Morgan students could vote there, even if you did not live in Baltimore City in Maryland or anything. You could come and you can vote. And um, I think that was really important because of the fact of, you know, the stigma behind that young people do not vote. And me being a member of the Black Girls Vote chapter at Morgan, it was really important to me to activate for like, you know, for young people to vote. I think it's important. You know, I have always voted ever since I was of age to vote. I have, you know, told my friends like, hey, like y'all need to vote. This is important. This is, you know, our lives, our livelihood. These people are in charge of our state, our country. So, you know, it's important to vote. And I think with our president really pushing for us to have the police station on campus was really important. Every day of the week when people could come vote, it was crowded. It was packed. The lines was long all the way out the campus to the street. People were lined up ready to vote. So I think that was something that really made me proud to be a student at Morgan. <laughs> my, my aspirations. Uh, actually, uh, now I got, you know, um, with my music degree, uh, I just hope to, to get a master's and then hopefully teach at a HBCU, uh, whether, you know, whether it's here or down South, but to, um, help a lot of students, music students, who, you know, who want to be music students and music major to know about the ins and out of the business. Um, and, 
you know, that, that's that's my goal to be a professor, you know, um, at a small HBCU college or something, you know, uh, something small, not not a big university, but, you know, just to teach. So that's my my aspirations and goal. And then hopefully retire after that. So. Well, I have to tell you, um, Thornton, that um, all you need is some of the classwork. I have a feeling you're going to be like my father when he earned his master's degree at Howard. And he knew yes. more than the professors. And they just said, we just need to just go on and give you the degree because we really can't. Uh, do uh, that's what I, 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 that's that's what I'm hoping for. I have a feeling you're going to be that situation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what I'm hoping for. Take care of my sheep. Be the voice of reason in chaos. We cannot begin to name all of those who are affiliated with HBCUs who have or are taking care of his sheep. There is not enough time. However, in this COVID-19 pandemic, one stood out who took a stand for righteousness to take care of the Lord's sheep. Keisha Lance Bottoms, the mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, and a graduate of Florida A&M University. To protect the citizens of Atlanta, Georgia, she had a legal face-off with the Georgia Governor Kemp, a governor who chose to disregard the science by not requiring the citizens of the state of Georgia to wear masks in public during the pandemic. In defiance, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms mandated mask wearing in Atlanta, Georgia. She put safety of the Lord's sheep before politics. Mayor Lance Bottoms, an HBCU graduate, stood her moral ground to protect God's sheep in the city of Atlanta, Georgia during a pandemic. Take care of my sheep. Be the voice for the voiceless until they can speak for themselves. Stacy Abrams, a Spelman College graduate, did not go away when she realized voter suppression kept her from becoming the governor of Georgia. Oh no, she organized. Her grassroots organizing skills made the Georgia presidential and senatorial election results decisive. Stacey Abrams heard the clarion call from Jesus, take care of my sheep. She moved to save the soul of America. She moved to save the lives of America. She, along with others in many cities and states, helped the sheep speak, and they did. The voices were heard resulting in the leadership of President Joseph Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris and a Howard University graduate. They are working with purpose and intentionality to stop the pandemic, to take care of his sheep, to save lives and to honor with dignity the losses caused by the pandemic. Take care of my sheep. Be the laborers in the harvest, change minds and attitudes. The accomplishments of those affiliated with HBCUs are too many to name, but it is clear that the graduates of HBCUs are intentional and with purpose to save this nation and the world from itself. The harvest, the work that has to be done to take care of his sheep is plentiful, but the laborers, HBCU graduates, are few. HBCUs cannot persist alone, as in the past, HBCUs stand with anyone and with any institution that uphold justice and righteousness or act with purpose and with intentionality to take care of the Lord's sheep. HBC grad, HBCU graduates and students will not be discouraged. They know who they are and to whom they belong. And after those from HBCUs have done all they can, they just stand. When you've done all you can name Seems like you can't make it through And what do you say when your friends turn away You're all alone Tell me what do you give When you've given your all Seems like you can't make it through 
shout you just stand when there's nothing left to do you just stand and watch the Lord see you through yes after you've done all you can you just stand tell me Guilt of your past. Tell me how do you deal with the shame? And how can you smile while your heart has been broken and filled with pain, filled with pain? Tell me what do you give when you give? Just stand when there's nothing left to do. You just stand and watch the Lord see you through. Yes, after you've done all you can, you just stand and be sure. In the bondage again, you just stand in God has a purpose, yes, God has a plan. Tell me what do you do when you turn all you can, and it seems like you can't make it through. Just stand. You just see it. See it. Through the storm. Stand through the rain. Through the hurt. Yeah. Stand through the pain. Be strong, be 
strong it's gonna work out it's gonna work out it's gonna work out it's gonna work out God will do it God will do it God will do it God will do it, God will do it. yes he'll do it yes he'll do it yes he'll do it here, they have shared with you the contributions of HBCUs. Yes, they have. Now, financial aid and the loan officers don't ask what your degree will be. They don't ask what your earning potential is. So an English major is going to pay the same tuition as an engineer or an accountant regardless of their earning potential. But we have the data, 75% of the African Americans who earn a doctoral degree have a foundation with an HBCU. The importance is, what do we do with that doctoral degree? We have to ask the right questions to solve solutions. So the other ones, the philosophers, the sociologists, the social workers, the political science majors, those are the ones who are adding that moral authority to our STEM majors, who are asked, and that helps them ask the right questions and solve solutions. So we really want our students to leave the university debt free if possible. That's with your contribution, your contributions to the HBCUs, to the 
United Negro College Fund. That will help our students so much so that they won't choose an area because of the earning potential, but they're gonna choose an area because of their talents. That's what we want. We want the students to choose their passion and do well in it. And they can only do that with support from you. So um, without further ado, I want to first of all congratulate Howard University for their reaccreditation. They have achieved their reaccreditation through the middle states with no contingencies, no contingencies. And so I would like to now introduce the leader of Howard University, Dr. Wayne Frederick. Good morning. Thank you to the Ward Memorial AME Church for the invitation to speak on HBCU Sunday. As a president of Howard University, I'm immensely grateful to the support of Ward Church and all AME churches in the Second Episcopal District. It is true that HBCUs in general, and Howard in particular, are in the midst of a national moment. The rise of the Black Lives Matter protest movement and the election of Howard alumna Kamala Harris to the vice presidency have culminated in a growing appreciation and recognition of the impact that HBCUs have always had on American society. For generations, Howard has been leading the caravan of social justice along with our peer HBCUs. We have been at the back of the caravan, pushing it forward, even as others have pushed against it. And we have been at the front of the caravan, steering it in the right direction, despite the buffeting forces at its side attempting to derail our efforts. At the present moment, legions of individuals and institutions have joined the caravan and echoed our calls for tolerance, for equality, and for justice. In this company, we are seeing progress. As it says in the book of Romans 12, 5, 8, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The will of social justice must be done by each of us as individuals but it also must be done collectively. Together we have to rejoice at our victories and weep at our shortcomings. While we will take advantage of this moment to enshrine our social justice gains into law and culture, the advocacy of these newfound writers may yet be fleeting. As both the triumphant and devastating moments of the past year retreat further and further into the rearview mirror, they will likely depart from the caravan and as they have done before during prior moments of racial reckoning. Fortunately though, this caravan to social justice will continue to move forward because of the AME Church's everlasting love and support for HBCUs like Howard. You have always ridden alongside us, using your feet to propel our cause forward, further and faster, and lending your voice to make our clarion calls for justice louder and more difficult to ignore. For the entirety of our existence, the AME Church has been there to prop up the foundations and encourage the visions of all HBCUs. And we have truly been partners in this most critical mission. So it is fitting that your HBCU Sunday celebration should come this month on the heels of Howard University's Charter Day Convocation, when we celebrate the story of our institution's birth. On March 2nd, 1867, Howard University's founding charter was signed into law by President Andrew Johnson, creating a place that would educate freed slaves and empower black Americans to participate more fully and autonomously in American society and our national economy. But the same day he signed our charter into law, President Johnson also vetoed the first reconstruction bill that would have given essential support to all black people living in America who were trying to transition from slavery to freedom, from oppression to opportunity. That Howard University was given life by an openly racist and misogynistic president 
is a confounding set of facts. As a man and as a politician, President Johnson was dedicated to the idea of an America that operated only for the benefit of one class of people. He was uninterested in living up and lifting up the very individuals Howard was designed to support. But from contradiction came clarity. This incongruity at the heart of Howard's existence did not buckle our foundations or splinter our guiding principles. Instead, it has crystallized our institutional purpose and set the stage for our prosperity. Howard University was created as a result of government action. As such, embedded into our fabric is the duty to support that government and the country of the United States. However, Howard has always understood that government in America, local, state, and federal, has not always operated in the best interest of its black, black residents. Certainly, before we were citizens, and even after we became Americans in the eyes of the law. The result of this tension was a recognition by Howard that America must be changed, and more importantly, an undaunted belief that it could be changed, and most essentially, that it was the responsibility of Howard and HBCUs to lead that change. And so Howard set out to become more than just an institution to train freed slaves. In that very founding charter, we were determined to be a full-fledged university, one where black people could come to get a complete and well-rounded education that enabled them to acquire knowledge and learn how to use it for a greater purpose. As it is stated in Ecclesiastes verse 7, chapter 7, verse 12, for the protection of wisdom is the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom perseveres the life of him who has it. Howard education became a most valuable currency because of the institution that imparted it. Clearly, Howard's primary duty was to educate the individuals who could go out into the society and bring about the change our country needed. But in addition, Howard as an institution had to represent what that change would be and what America would become. So from its very beginning, Howard was a university for all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or religion. It was and has been and still is a space where all people can live safely, study, and work together side by side. Howard has been a mecca for those who could not find education elsewhere. From its early days, Howard led in women, both white and black, who were barred from attending other institutions. Jewish refugees who fled persecution in Europe were turned away from most American colleges and universities when they reached our country's shores. They only found that, that America they were promised one of sanctuary and acceptance upon arriving at Howard and other HBCUs. So from the ashes of the Civil War, Howard was called into existence with our nation's capital, in our nation's capital, to envision a new order of America. One that was refashioned on the ideas of freedom and equality for all people. We were built to be a beacon, sending out a signal throughout the country of what a better America would look like. And today, HBCUs continue to live up to that legacy. While most of our colleges and universities serve majority black students on our campuses, they're still graced and enriched by people from all different backgrounds. The blackness of HBCUs is meant to convey a sense of pride and responsibility, not exclusivity. We are not black schools the way so many institutions of higher education in the 19th century were reserved only for white men. Instead, we are black schools because of what we teach. HBCUs surround our students with a narrative of black excellence so that they may be inspired to pursue greatness, pushed to accept social responsibility, and driven to develop the confidence needed to change the world. In a country that has a legacy of castigating blackness and insisting that it is a detriment that must be overcome or squashed out, HBCUs have helped redefine blackness as a superpower that gives strength and perseverance to those who embrace it in themselves and others. Howard has a distinct duty and capability to shine a light of hope in a place where progress is fitful and feels uncertain. Despite the black community's history of enslavement and injustice in a country defined on the proposition of liberty and justice for all, it is Howard's responsibility to reconcile the American paradox. While we can never disentangle the deeply woven contradictions of our nation's roots, we can still hope to realize America's founding ideals for all people. Our historic responsibility enshrined in our university's founding fuels our present-day mission 
to cultivate forward-thinking leaders who elevate the truth and dedicate themselves to service in order to better our country. So as it is said in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 7, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. We may be strangers in this land, but we still have a responsibility to claim ownership over it if we want to receive equality and tolerance. We must make America more equal and more tolerant. It's no surprise that HBCUs have such a strong history of cultivating leaders in America. Many of our students, faculty, and staff come from underprivileged and under-resourced communities. They understand the problems of our society and understand that they are fortunate enough to receive an education and be in a position to do something about those, those issues. HBCU students are seeing all that is wrong with our society, from the pandemic and healthcare in inequities to police murders and systemic racism. And they want to come to our colleges and universities to learn how they can be leaders who work on these issues. How it has always existed at the nexus of America's pain and its promise. We were planted intentionally close to the government that had both allowed our enslavement and granted our freedoms. In order to hold America to account for the wrongs it committed and to insist on its reformation going forward. Our mission has always been to elevate and insist on the truth and to use the truth as a guardrail toward progress. We have a responsibility of service to America, a country that has not always served our interests. We are committed to combining America's hallowed ideals with the truth about its flaws to mold a better nation and a more equal society. From the horrors of the Civil War, how it saw this potential of America. Howard did not retreat from this country, but decided to reside within it in order to change it from the inside. Howard and HBCUs have an abiding love for America and believe in its promise. Yes, we were created from pain and anger, but we were fashioned out of love and hope. The black community received and witnessed unspeakable horrors done in the name of America and enshrined into law in this country. But despite all of that, it was never our intention to leave. We had an enduring belief that we could be both American and black. We could have spaces that, of course, invited others in, but that were distinctly our own. Our HBCUs and our AME churches provided those places of solace. These are black spaces within America, places where we could temporarily forget our blackness forget our otherness, and explore the depths of ourselves in community with other people who look like us. And we would also be invited and welcomed in other parts of society as equals, as Americans. In these spaces, our differences would be appreciated. Our blackness would be considered a critical part of the whole. Like no one else, we saw America for what it was and what it could be. And we know that we were the only ones who could realize America's tremendous promise. HBCUs as institutions have a unique and essential perspective on what America means. A country where each individual could reach their human potential for the betterment of themselves and their neighbors, their own communities and all communities. A country that thrives when each person is allowed to thrive and perishes when one is prioritized above another. The world needs an America that's more closely aligned with the values and vision of our HBCUs. Howard University has 154 years worth of gratitude for the AME Church that we still need to pay off. But still, we must ask for your continued support because there's still more work to do. And we must do that work together. Thank you for your attention and time today. And thank you for your constant and unfledgling love and affection that you have given to HBCUs every day. It does not go unrecognized or underappreciated. Amen. Come on and join me in thanking President Frederick for such an eloquent reminder and the continued partnership between the AME Church and Howard University. But not only Howard University, but all historically black colleges and universities a place where lives were changed. 
generations are made better. We are the recipients of the learning and teaching that took place at these institutions. And so we come now today responding to the challenge of staying on the path of being change agents. But there's no way that we can become change agents if we haven't been changed ourselves. If you are here today and you have not accepted the Lord as your Savior, will you come now uh, to accept God as your Savior? Will you come now running to this virtual altar declaring that you want God to lead you and guide you? Because you know that, that you, you, you can't make it without God. If you are in need of a church home, will you come now? Will you call us? Will you send an email if you have a special prayer request? You can never become a change agent if you have never allowed God to change you. Will you come right now? Is there one? Come on, the hymnologist says, lead me. Oh, I want you to Along the way, oh, oh, if you leave me, I cannot say, Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Whoever you are, come right now. Help me tread in the path of righteousness. Be my aid when Satan and sin, sin oppress. I am putting all my trust in. Is there one? Is there one? Is, Whoa, is there one? Is there one? Is there one? Come right now. Don't 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 wait another day. If you leave, is there one right now? Come right now. Come. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Gracious and eternal God, we pray now for that person who, who refuses to make the decision to allow you to lead them, oh God. We pray now that you will change their heart and their mind. God, we pray now for that person whose, whose body is in pain. We pray now that infirmities will be removed, God. We pray for that person who's convalescing at this very moment. We pray for that person who's in the hospital by themselves. Family, I cannot visit them, oh God. We pray now for that person who's at home all alone. We pray now for that child who doesn't want to go back to school. God, we pray now for that child who feels isolated being at home. We pray now, God, that for that person who, who is lonely, who misses a loved one, oh God, we know that you can fill the void that now exists. And so, God, we say thank you. God, we pray for that believer 
who is yet to come we pray for that believer who is on the way right now God we pray that you will lead him or her to your altar God we pray that relationships will be restored we pray that families will be brought back together we pray now God that you will strengthen this ministry that you will strengthen this church God strengthen its members oh God we pray now for our churches God in this second Episcopal district we pray now for our Episcopal leaders God Bishop and Mother Davis we pray now God for presiding elders and their spouses we pray now for that church who's debating what to do for HBCUs God we pray that we will follow your heart and your mind that we shall never forget about the least of these God so have your way in the name of Jesus we pray and we shall forever keep singing and allowing you to lead us along the way for if you lead us we cannot stray come on let's sing it one more time as we say amen come on come on come on come on oh, I want you to lead me and along And as we now prepare for our giving, we're going to sing, uh, I need you, you need me to survive. So we're going to ask you right now to secure your devices that you can uh, participate in this sacrificial giving. Uh, this does not replace our normal tithes and offerings that we bring to the storehouse each week. But we are asking you to make a sacrificial offering for this historically black colleges and universities Sunday. Will you do so at this time? Has God led you to uh, this point? Did you hear all of the statistics that uh, Dr. Jones laid out in this passage in his readings that were done tonight? There is a fundamental place for HBCUs in the lives of our young people. So will you come down? Let us secure our devices and let us pray before we bring our gifts to God. Amen. Gracious and eternal God, we pray that you will bless every gift and every giver. I bless those who don't have it to give right now. But God, lead them to become change agents in your world, in your church. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. I need you. Come bring your gifts right you now. There are three ways to give. We're all a part of God's body. Come right now. Stand Come with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is His will that every need be supplied. come come have you given God your best have you given God your best come give now I need you you need me we're all a part of God's body stand with me agree with me we're all a part of God's body Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for the gifts that have been brought into your storehouse, God. 
we thank you for every gift that's been given God we pray now uh, that you will consecrate that you will multiply that you will bless our gifts God that our gifts will be used to fulfill your uh, kingdom here on earth God we pray now that we will bless a, a young person God we pray now that someone will graduate having old less than what they did when they went into school God we pray now uh, that you will do more than we can ever imagine in the name of Jesus we say thank you for every gift that's been brought into your storehouse in the name of Jesus we pray amen and amen 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 I need you to survive Amen. We thank God for everything that's been said and done this morning, and we want to thank God. Will you join me in thanking and bringing to this microphone none other than Dr. Linda Jones, Ph.D.? Our one of our resident Ph.D.s in the Ward Church family. We thank God for her. She serves as the assistant dean of the graduate school at Howard University, and she is not ashamed to use the gifts and graces that God has given her for the advancement of God's kingdom. And so we want to celebrate and thank her this morning for allowing her gifts to be used in this church. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Jones, uh, for doing everything that you did to bring this together with such short notice i think we've only had about uh, three weeks to get this together and she did it she was able to get her boss here and we thank god for her and i am just so elated and so thankful and so i'm going to allow her to come down and then i will come back with the announcements and the benediction amen thank you pastor I felt really honored when he asked me to um, chair the HBCU um, Sunday. So thank you, Pastor. I want to thank the ward members for participating. We ask for you to provide your names if you graduated from an HBCU. I first of all want to apologize to Dr. Andrew Jenkins III, who is very much alive, and so please disregard what's on the chart for you. We love you, Dr. Jenkins. So without further ado, let's recognize our HBCU current students and alumni um, from Ward Memorial AME Church.
told me, nobody told me that the road I can't believe it. Amen. We are so thankful and delighted what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard. And we salute all of you for making the decision that you made to attend the colleges and universities that you did attend. And we, we, we certainly do not shy away from those persons who did not attend an HBCU. We thank you. Uh, but we understand that everyone has a decision to make and so uh, we pray for you as well and we pray for those institutions as well but we 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 came together today uh, to celebrate the contributions of our HBCUs not discounting or discrediting what the other institutions have the roles that they have played but just wanted to say thank you uh, to those beloved institutions and so once again thank you out quickly just for our announcements remember our uh, weekly prayer calls are each Monday Wednesday and Fridays at 6 30 a.m. Bible study is held at noon um, on Wednesdays and at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays youth and young adults is the second a Sunday second and fourth Sundays at 8 o'clock p.m. We thank God for you. Remember those persons who are on our sick and shutting list and that we will just begin to display their names and we'll just have some appropriate music playing as you whisper a silent prayer for the names that are, are going across the screen for you at this moment. Just lift those names in prayer. Pray for those persons. Pray for those persons. Pray for those persons. Remember their names. Call their names when you whisper a prayer. Amen. And we pray that God will continue to bless them. And then finally, uh, we are so delighted in COVID. We were trying to figure out how to do anything with Ash Wednesday and, and, and not doing anything for Ash Wednesday. But I'm excited to stand before you this morning and announce uh, that we will have a Good Friday service at 12 noon and at 7 p.m. 12 noon and 7 p.m. and we are we are going with the theme daughters of thunder and so our own the reverend christian belton minister to youth and young adults has pulled together a cadre of youth and young adult female preachers who are going to preach the unadulterated word of god for us it will be a virtual service just like we are hosting right now but i'm inviting you because a lot of thought has gone into how do we come to you on good friday amen you may have to fry your own fish for good friday but we can bring god's word to you on good friday amen so will you spread the word the flyer will be coming and we ask that you spread the word share the word share the good news about what's going on at your church tell somebody thank god for these singers who also narrated this whole situation this whole worship experience today amen ward foods is also uh, on next saturday next saturday third saturday ward foods will be next third saturday eight o'clock a.m to 11 o'clock a.m please spread the word spread the word we have a lot of food that we need to distribute in this community and other communities so make sure you spread the word thank god for this band thank god for this band amen 
and thank God for our multimedia ministry thank God for multimedia thank God for multimedia and thank God for our office staff and our finance staff thank God for all of you and thank God for everyone who participated who came allowed us to come into your homes and allowed yourselves to be taped to, per to participate virtually in this worship experience thank you for sharing your testimony thank you for being a beacon of light and hope in this dark world and so we pray that God will bless you and that God will keep you and remember the best is yet to come your best days are still in front of you and now let us all stand for the benediction now may the grace of God sweet communion of his Holy Ghost may the rest rule and abide with you henceforth now and forevermore and let us all sing together Yeah.